Welcome everybody. Uh, my name is Didier Henriant and I'm delighted to uh, chairing this uh, morning session on mathematics optimization for AI uh, with my co-chair Yaku Marecek, who is uh, just right here. And without further ado, I will introduce uh, with great pleasure uh, the first speaker, uh, who is uh, Jérôme Bolt from Toulouse School of Economics. And I uh, will be speaking about uh, non-smooth automatic differentiation. Thank you, Didier. And thank you, uh, everyone, Jakub, Joseph, Veronique. Uh, it's a very nice invitation, and I'm very impressed by uh, what is done here in uh, Czech Republic. So thank you for this invitation. Okay, so uh, my talk is about uh, automatic differentiation. I would like first to have a quick word on uh, what is it. It seems uh, technical. Uh, I would say, uh, perhaps in a provocative ma manner, that learning in AI is basically tuning weights of a neural network or, or some other system. And for tuning, you need to differentiate. And so, um, auto automatic differentiation, AutoDiff auto in short, is a super fast uh, algorithm for differentiating. And one of its strengths is that it applies to most numerical programs, from solvers to algorithm and all that. Uh, and if I wanted to make a, um, a provocative statement, I would say that uh, training, uh, uh, deep learning, uh, uh, training uh, a neural network is basically aggregating auto automatic differentiation operations, okay? So this is uh, very uh, important. But there is a, a serious issue in that uh, thing, which is that modern programs are non-differentiable uh, by nature. <coughs> and since we want to differentiate, well, we have a problem. So uh, it is easy to see this uh, non-differentiability issue by looking at conditional statements in programs. Um, by conditional statements, I mean the if, then, else. And these uh, type of things create naturally branches. And on branches, you have different functions which have different values. And this creates non-smoothness, OK? You have other. Uh, uh, way of creating, I don't know, it, yeah, to, to non-smoothness, but this one is essential. And you see here with the ReLU function, you have a zero function and identity. And it creates a, a non-smooth point. Okay, uh, so um, to analyze this issue, we are going to focus on a special method, which is called the backpropagation algorithm. So it goes like that, so you have uh, a function, which is a composition of elementary functions, <clears throat> basically uh, addition, multiplication, and, and, and basic functions. And the, the backdrop uh, algorithm is a very fast instantiation of the chain rule. Okay, so we apply the chain rule on this, and uh, we compute the chain rule backward, okay? And it's a way to go very fast with the chain rule. And as I said, <coughs> the problem we meet is that we have non-smoothness. So we have to deal with this non-smoothness, okay? Uh, so how do we do that? We used to, we, we need to use this, um, Clark Jacobians, and Clark Jacobians are uh, a way to uh, modelize differentiation of non-smooth point. So at a non-smooth point, uh, you define a, a subgradient as the limit of neighboring points. So you obtain a bunch of subgradient like that, and you are allowed to convexify this guy. Okay, so here. These guys represent non-smooth derivative. And so we have our non-smooth derivative. So let's wrap up uh, with the, the, the backpropagation algorithm. We start uh, with function like that, okay? Um, 
a composition. And we differentiate this. We apply the chain rule. And here we put Clark uh, Jacobians. OK? But the problem, the major problem, is that the chain rule does not hold. We are not allowed to do that. Uh, in the sense that the, the object we obtain is not a Clark Jacobian. So we get out of the class. And the thing which is very surprising is that this approach, which is used everywhere in the world, in all uh, softwares uh, and libraries, uh, is that it works remarkably well. And um, since it works, we would like to understand why it does. OK? So we stick to practice, and we accept uh, this imperfection, and see what, it go what, what we see. Uh, OK? So uh, let's have a look at what uh, problem we can face with this approach. So here, uh, I have programmed uh, the function 1 third. It's constant. Its value is 1 third. But uh, its program is a bit weird. It, uh, it is like that, OK? So the function is here, and, 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 and the program is here. When you differentiate applying the chain rule, you get a derivative at 0, which is 1, which is uh, not very uh, natural, right? And you can do an uh, even worse thing, because <coughs> if you adapt a bit all that, you can uh, program the identity function in a weird way, and the de derivative of the identity at zero is zero. So this time you create an artificial critical point, which is not wishable because critical points are uh, the place where algorithms are, are stuck. Okay, <coughs> so uh, given a, a locally Lipschitz continuous function, we would like to define an object that model all this thing. So it should allow spuriosity, so this weird behavior. <coughs> it should allow derivation, and it should match backprop. OK? So uh, it's, a, it's a bit uh, special, because um, we want uh, to uh, allow a, a loose behavior, but we want also to be sharp to keep the variational content of the process. OK? And so um, to do that, we are going to apply uh, this ID. We take a function, and uh, we say that this bunch of gradient we would like to describe satisfies a, a weak chain rule along curves. So it is an identity like that in which uh, you have, let's say, a C1 curve to start, and the differential of your function is like that, like in the chain rule. But, uh, <coughs> oh, sorry. What happened? Yeah, OK. Uh, here, uh, you can choose any subgradient you want in, in, in that place. And it has to be to coincide with that for almost all t. OK? So this is uh, the central uh, definition we have. And so uh, I would like uh, to comment a bit on this formula, which is uh, quite natural. First, uh, it means that the process sees curve. Because on a curve, and if you know the derivative of this, you can rebuild f. But on the other hand, it is blind to zero measure set on, on, on curve. So it allows periodicity. <coughs> so we have a trade-off between sharpness and looseness. OK? Uh, and it goes the same for general function with conservative Jacobians. And now I would like you to uh, uh, remind this definition. <clears throat> if a function has a conservative field, so if there is a guy that satisfies that, 
then it is called pass differentiable. Okay? So we have, if we have that, we are called pass differentiable. Okay, and now let's see uh, what uh, we obtain with this type of uh, definition. So I have just recalled the, the definition there. So here I am listing the, the main property. The first one is that uh, pass differentiable are ubiquitous. Uh, so for those who know, definable functions which are locally Lipschitz are automatically pass differentiable. This is due uh, to stratification. And for those you who don't know, it basically means if you have a function that you can write with a general formula, uh, with uh, sinus, cosinus, max, uh, whatever, polynomial, then uh, you have a pass differentiable function. So basically, uh, al almost all functions you, you see are pass differentiable. Uh, <clears throat> now, what is a natural conservative field for a pass differentiable? Well, the Clark subgradient does the job. Uh, it, and it's actually the smallest. Uh, something else about this conservative gradient and their uh, variational content, uh, they coincide almost everywhere with the gradient. So we have uh, very strong variational content and it's easy to see the chain rule holds in general now, okay? Not only on curve, you have the chain rule. Okay, so we have uh, a calculus that comes with this function, okay? So, uh, <clears throat> as I said at the beginning, backpropagation is central uh, in artificial intelligence, and now we have this tool to understand it. And um, what will happen is basically that backpropagation is a conservative field, almost. If you take the convex envelope, it's a conservative field, okay? So we understand now this object, and we are able to uh, obtain guarantee, obtain theorem in artificial intelligence related to this back propagation. So we start with the object itself. So you have a loss, uh, standard loss, which is uh, in the form of a sum, and uh, the first, so this guy is uh, Lipschitz and, and definable. So the first thing we have is that the back propagation is equal to the gradient almost everywhere. This was not known. That's quite incredible, but people uh, used it, but it was not proved uh, any, anywhere. And you need uh, witness stratification, so it's not so easy. It is the same here. <coughs> Uh, you have this identity. <clears throat> and so this thing is a conservative field. And there is something also uh, with which we have to be careful. You can have a zero for back prop, which is not critical. These are the artificial critical point I was mentioning at the beginning. Okay? So this is what we can say uh, uh, for back prop. We can go a bit uh, further uh, and see why backprop is fast. Why is it so essential to AI? So for this, we need uh, a bit of uh, notation. So given uh, a neural net, let's say with ReLU activation, we are going to a cost arithmetic computation, meaning plus, times, and ReLU. They have all the same cost for the, the uh, in this talk. And uh, I count the, the, the minimal number of this uh, computation to evaluate my network. I form the loss of my network, the square loss, and I do the same. I evaluate, I count all the operation I need. Okay? Uh, and now the question is, what is the cost of computing the gradient the back prop on L. It would be tempting to say that it depends on the dimension because uh, a gradient is uh, many coordinates, okay, the number of uh, the dimension. 
And with the theory we have, we have this theorem which says that back backpropagation achieves this complexity result. Computing L and backprop L is not more, more costly than five times L. So <clears throat> I guess this is the reason why we can train deep neural network. It's super fast. It's super fast and there, there, there are no dimension term in this thing. There is one in L, of course, but not in backprop. <clears throat> okay, so backprop is super, is cheap to compute. Uh, now, uh, some word about training. So you all know that very well. So we have an empiric sum. We do stochastic gradient. Okay, we draw uniformly at random some of the of the guy, and we do a gradient uh, in that direction. <clears throat> And this is uh, how we train the, the network. And, and the question is, does it reach critical point? And does it reach local minima? And what about artificial point also, artificial critical point? So we have this theorem, which is too long. So long story short, um, with probability one, uh, you reach only Clark critical uh, point uh, with uh, this method. And even more, it's not written, but uh, it's doable, so young people should perhaps do that. You can prove that generically you reach local minimizers. Okay? So that's, of course, important for, for IA. Uh, so maybe uh, two last results. So here it's about uh, implicit network. So here you have layers that are implicit, <coughs> uh, which means that uh, they are uh, obtained by solving an equation or an optimization problem. Uh, they are known to uh, be a bit more efficient than usual layers. You need less implicit layers than usual layers. Um, so let's take a layer like that. X is the entry, and Y is the output, okay? So, like that. And uh, we would like to propagate derivative in this network uh, to train it. So how can we do that? Well, for engineer, it's very simple. Uh, you take the equation, you write this formula, you differentiate. Uh, you don't care, <laughs> of course, of differentiability. Uh, and then you invert, and you have your formula. <clears throat> but, uh, of course, it's not uh, like that normally, because this object uh, is uh, non-smooth, okay? And so uh, we have been able to justify all that. This object, which is a bit weird, uh, is actually conservative under mild assumption, which are similar to the smooth case. And so we can train implicit network using this formula. OK, and I will end uh, with uh, something which is uh, quite fashionable uh, this time, which is differentiating algorithms. <clears throat> so how does it work? So you have a, a, a family of strongly convex problems here. Theta is a parameter. And uh, so you want to solve for uh, this method. Okay, but perhaps uh, after you want to optimize in theta, you want to, to compute the sensitivity in theta, you, you, you want to do things with theta. Uh, so you run your algorithm. In theory, at the end, you obtain the solution of your method. And the question is, can, uh, could we compute at the same time <coughs> the solution and the derivative? So the solution and a variation. And so uh, there is a, a simple thing to do, which is uh, <coughs> you have your algorithm like that, and at the same time it progresses, you can compute the derivative just by applying this formula, okay, uh, which is known as piggyback derivatives uh, for obvious reasons, because you follow the the ferroutage in French. Yeah, in Czech, I don't know. Uh, 
Uh, <clears throat> and so you obtain an object, x prime k, which converge, okay? But in general, we don't know to what kind of object uh, it converge, and it can converge to a multi-valued object. And again, here, we have discovered that the limit of uh, this object uh, is a conservative Jacobian. In other words, uh, we can use all the theory uh, on this uh, derivation of uh, algorithm as well to optimize in terms of theta or to, to do whatever we want with theta. Okay, so I think I'm done. I don't know if um, I've been too long. And many thanks, Jerome, for uh, this uh, survey of foundational work for, uh, for uh, AI. Uh, we have time for, uh, I would say, two short questions from the audience, using the microphone, preferably. Joseph? One quick one. In in practice, there is often difference in what algorithm one uses. If one you know for the Can you speak? Yeah. in in practice, there is often difference what algorithm one uses for the optimization. Can one like is it Adagrad or is it just a stochastic gradient descent? Can you also say something about this, or this is still uh, beyond? You mean the discrepancy between practice and. Uh... Yeah, I mean, it's like, does it depend, you know, or can, can one say something about the, what algorithms to also use for the optimization? I know that these were quite foundational results, what you were showing, but... Uh, uh, you mean other algorithm than SGD? Yeah, yeah, for example. Yeah, well, it needs to be, uh, uh, sorry, it, it needs to be studied, I guess, so there are plenty of things to, uh, to understand. So, so, so simply, if there is a, an idea behind, behind that, it was to understand what is backprop mathematically. Then we have this answer, and we need to, to, to use it to make uh, further studies. Another one, maybe? Mihai? Thank you, Jérôme. Uh, if we start with splines, let's say, uh, piecewise polynomial uh, functions, is your algorithm uh, performing very fast? Is uh, de detecting the partial derivatives and so on? So uh, in, the, in the experiment uh, we have made, uh, we have observed something uh, quite funny. If you have at high precision, mm -hmm. you never see the problem. But if you are at low precision, saying 60, uh, 16 bits, you start to see the problem. And at 8 bits, you see almost always the problem. Mm -hmm. So <laughs> mathematically, the, the answer, yes, you can do. Uh, and if you I'm know asking that... because uh, they are finitely determined. You know, you, a spline is determined by finitely many parameters. And in fact, yeah. you, you should be able to extract from this yeah. Finite determinateness, everything very quickly. Yeah, but, but yeah, I would say it it it, it, it works. should work. Yeah, yeah, it it would work. I'm uh, I think it's past differentiable, and so you can just plug it in here and then boof. Yeah, so, it was nice to see Edward at work. Yeah. <laughs> Many thanks. Uh, for the sake of time, we have to move forward to the second speaker. Thanks again, Jerome.